Crack them up, boys. Praise God. Thank you, Bill. Can you all say thanks, Bill? All the way from Homeville, Idaho. He drove out here for a, a steel guitar convention. And your pastor, Dave, was with us a couple, about a month or so ago. And Bill said, you know what? You ought to talk Keith into coming. And I'm already going to be out there, so we'll come and do some music and stuff. And so your pastor said, okay, we should do that. However, yesterday was a little tough because I had to preach at a, a cutting in uh, Paso Robles, California. And uh, so I left on Friday, flew down there and did church. And by the way, because it was such a big show, they made the classes earlier. So normally we start, we have church from seven to eight and they start the cutting at eight. This time they started the cutting at seven. So I had to start, actually I started, this is a little hot. Um, you want me to change the mics? Um, what, um, what happened though is um, I told him, I said, listen, we're, I, can, I can do a half hour s uh, message and music. So I said, we'll start at 6.30. Well, everybody shows up there and they were all whining and complaining. It's so early, it's so early. I said, I saved you 30 minutes <laughs> because the option was to have it on Sunday and then we would have had it at seven o'clock, but the time changed, which would have meant it's really six o'clock for y'all. So I didn't make it six, I made it 6.30. I thought that was pretty, pretty nice of me. Amen. So then I had this one-way flight come in here yesterday, and I'm driving along in a, out in the middle of nowhere in one of those little rental cars, and all of a sudden, pop, I blew a tire. I missed my flight. Pastor Dave had to pick me up last night, 11 o'clock, which is really 12 o'clock because of the time change. And by the time he and I got done talking and fellowshipping and I'm operating on two hours sleep. He's probably operating on a half hour sleep, but that's, that's typical of us, amen? And can I just tell you, I am honored to be linked with this ministry. I'm truly honored. I mean, we've known each other for years and years and years and years and years, and we have a lot of good stories, and I know you heard stories, and I'm not sure if you heard the right story or not. <laughs> but, um, you know... <laughs> We have had some awesome times, and it's all, and I can tell you, it's, it's really neat coming here because it feels like home. It really does. And we just moved into our new building about three months ago. Um, looks kind of similar to this. Um, we doubled our size. We were, when we were in the barn, we were right about 60 people on Sunday, and now we're about 130. And we're, we just brought in more chairs. So uh, really exciting things happen, amazing things happen. Of course, I can tell you also, when you got more people, you got also got more problems. So pray for us, okay? <laughs> Say it isn't so. Uh, so last week, I was honored to lead a whole family to the Lord in my office. It was just wonderful. Amen. Praise God. And then I left the office and went out in the sanctuary, and some gentleman decides he doesn't appreciate the way I do things and just got in my face and chewed me out. And I said, he is not going to rob me of my joy. So, you know, all I can do is tell you this. It's not easy being a pastor. Hold them up in prayer, love on them. And trust me, whenever you, I know, and whenever they, whenever you take the place of a leadership role, you put yourself in a position to get sh shot at. And why not? I mean, who else are you going to go to if there's something going on here that you're not in agreement with, but you can do it in love. Amen? That's right. We're all in this, in unity and in love and displaying the love of Christ with one another. And, and uh, yeah, and you can't do it on the run from one church to the next. You need to fall in love with people and stay there. Anyway, I said all of that just for fun. Okay, so go to Romans chapter um, 8. And I thought I was going to do something on the resurrection. It was a good message, but I really feel I need to go here. This is something that I've been preaching for about two months in our church. Um, we just finished, actually, a whole series. And um, it's, it's been really powerful. And by the way, if you watch um, 
Tech Room devotional, which is my five-minute devotional every day, video devotional. I touch on it quite a bit. And oh, and by the way, we're up live streaming just like y'all, you know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So my church is someplace in the web flying around out here. and It's kind of cool. Anyway, so um, all I can do is tell you this. You know, if, if I'm training my horse... I'm going to do it different than if I'm training my dog. Amen? Anybody train horses in here or have anything to do with horses? You know, I'm going to just complain about something else. What's wrong with you guys? We're in Texas, good country music, and y'all were just sitting there. My goodness. We dance in Idaho. And I got video to prove it. Anyway, um, same thing here. There's no horses in Texas? Anyway, when you train horses, I'll just tell you. When you train horses, you train them different than you train your dogs. Okay? And you train your kids different than you train your dogs. And you deal with your wife in a whole different way than you deal with anybody else. Why? Because she speaks a different language. Can I get an amen from you men? Come on. Our wives speak a different language. And it's not because they're being vicious about it or anything. It's just that they see things different than we do as men. And I like it. I think God did a great job. I think God has a sense of humor either, too. I mean, I really do think he's got a sense of humor. But um, and it's the same thing with God. We find scripture after scripture, like the one we're going to look at right now, that's so important for us to understand When we go before God, yes, we can go just, you know, bringing us, you know, because he he wants us there. Yet at the same time, we need to understand that he speaks a different language. He comes from a different place. See, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So when you look here in uh, Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 6, it says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is death is life and peace. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems pretty cowboy simple. Carnal mind brings about death. Spiritual mind brings about life and peace. I could ask you right now, but I already know the answer. Which would you choose? The spiritual mind. But how much time are we spending practicing using our spiritual mind rather than our carnal? If, if you read all of uh, here, well, let's just do this. If you look in chapter 7, Paul says some crazy things here. For instance, let's start with uh, verse 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For, I, for what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Does anybody uh, relate to this? I mean, we want to do good. We want to please God. We want him to go, well done, my good and faithful servant. I mean, that's, that's what life is all about. And yet even Paul here is going, man, I will to do good, but there's something in me. And if you look at it, if you jump up to verse 22, it says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. So his spirit man delights in the law of God. Say law of God. Law of God. God. But now in verse 23, it says, but I see another law. So now we're talking about the law of God, but now we see another law in my members. So where's that law? It's in our flesh, right? It's in our human, uh, humanity. Do you see that? It's, but it's in our flesh. I see another law in my members, and watch this. That law in my members, in my flesh, wars against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So now we found out what law is in the members. It's the law of sin. You guys with me? You see, there's a law of sin in our members. Isn't it amazing? And I know I've shared this before here, but Jesus, we're created in the likeness and image of God, just like Jesus, right? And so we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. Um, 
What Jesus did when he came to earth is he put on humanity. He put on flesh. What do we find that's in our members, in our flesh? The law of sin. That's why the Bible says that he was tempted with every single temptation that you and I had because the law of sin was in humanity. But he never gave in to it. Told us and showed us how not to. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I want you to learn to have a spiritual mind and, and know how to get there. Right? And Paul goes on to tell us, so, so we have the law of God that's in our inward man. We have the law of sin that dwells on our flesh. And we have the law of the mind in our soul. And he goes on, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Why does he say that? Because the carnality brings about death. We just read that. The carnal mind brings about death. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This carnality of death. Do you see that? Okay, so it goes on to say, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So he's not, he's, Paul is not saying that you and I aren't going to have problems dealing with the law of sin. He says it's there. But now he goes on and he starts telling us that there's no condemnation to now to those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Tells us, look at this, look at this. And I know I preached this here before. For the law of the spirit of life, verse 2 of chapter 8. For the law of spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin. So the law of the spirit of life. Do you see we're talking about a spiritual mind? Are you seeing that? What has set us free? It's not the law of the flesh. It's not the law of the sin. It's not even the law of the mind. It's the law of the spirit of Christ that's in us. And it causes us to soar above the law of sin and the law of death. Amen. And we can do that, but we have to actively get involved. We have to say, from this day forward, I am going to become a spiritual-minded person. And we practice those things. Oh, yeah, you know, we want to see a, a, a move of the Holy Spirit. So we come to church and we wait for the praise band to hit the right chord and the right thing and get things rolling. And, 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 and then maybe pastor gets up and gets a, gives a word or a prophecy or something. And I mean, the, the spirit starts to flow. But I'm here to tell you that can happen every single day, every moment, every, every single day, if we practice having a law of, the, uh, law of the mind. I mean, a spiritual mind. We can practice that every day. We, we need to place him number one in our lives. In other words, when you go to work, what do you go to work for? To make money? Are you kidding me? He gave you that. That's a special gift. And the reason why you're hired is because you have a gift from God. And what is that gift for? It's to bring glory to him. Start going to work with that in mind. I'm here today to glorify my God and my Lord and my Savior. And people are going to see Christ in me, the hope of glory. And I don't care who it hair lips. I don't care what they think. I'm going to live my life according to the word of God. And we're going to get into that. Okay, so... Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because, now watch this, the carnal mind is enmity against God. So how many people in here want to have a carnal mind? Well, that'd be foolish. It's enmity against God. Which tells me I have to practice not having a carnal mind. I got to get it out because every time that carnal mind kicks in gear, every time you say you can't do something when God is telling you to do, that's a carnal mind because you're looking at yourself thinking that you are the one that's going to do it. Uh-huh. Look with me. Uh, we're going to stay in Romans, so kind of stay there in Romans. But go, go to John chapter 3. This is kind of where it all began or begins. You know the story of Nicodemus, right? And he comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, verse 5, most assuredly, well, let's back up to verse 3. Jesus says, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, my Bible is very, very clear that I am not of this world. Why? Because it's the carnal, it's, it's that carnality. I am not of this world. I'm of the kingdom of God. Now this is telling me, unless you're born again, you cannot see that kingdom. 
So it begins here. Well, what does that mean? Making a profession of faith or just praying a prayer? Well, no, it's actually inviting God to be the Lord of your life. <laughs> to be number one in your life. To be everything. If I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, then I'm dead. So it should be all about him. It's not me who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Amen? And, and for us who are born again, we understand that. I tell people this all the time when I lead them to the Lord. In fact, this family that I led to the Lord the other day, I told them, I said, I, I want you to, when I explained to them, because they didn't have a clue about the blood, they didn't have a clue about redemption at all, or, or, or why God even loves them. And so I sat at my desk and I walked them through, and the little girl's 10 years old, been diagnosed with leukemia. <laughs> but we know what happens with leukemia when we show up with the power of God, the presence of God, and the knowledge of Almighty God. Those things have to flee. They have to. They cannot be in the presence of Rapha. Jehovah Rapha shows up, and Jehovah Rapha lives in me and lives in you. So you show up, that healing shows up. Disease and sickness has to flee. Anyway, I explained all this to them, and it was wonderful, but they, they didn't have a clue. And I said to them, I said, now, I'm going to tell you something. Here's, here's my problem. You guys are in a major fight right now, and I'm on my own. And they looked at me weird. I said, well, you're asking me to pray for you, but you have never accepted Jesus Christ in your, in your life, so all the promises in the Bible don't belong to you. All the blessings that it talks about, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, they don't belong to you. So what you're really doing is you're asking me to come with my faith, with my understanding of the word, lay hands on you, and, and I believe with all my heart you're going to be delivered and healed. But will you be able to maintain it? Because the first time Satan shows up, you're going to be just in, 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 in field with fear. So... What I need is I need you to be on my team. I need to, you to give your life to Christ because the moment you do that, all of the blessings that I have, all of the promises that I have, all this victory that I preach about all the time becomes yours. Instantly. You don't have to wait for it. Instantly. And then you enter the battle with me. Now we get to fight together. We got, a, we got a, a, um, a, um, an army. We have an army now. But for me to fight it for you, it just isn't going to work. And I said, but I don't want you to make this decision tonight. I want you to pray about it. And the mother said, yeah, we will. And then, of course, they came back and they entered in. I said, now let's pray. What, what a difference. What a, what a change in, in the atmosphere in that place. It was just filled with the presence of God. So they couldn't see the kingdom of God. Now they see, you ought to see the looks on their faces too. They are so bubbly and they're concerned about dad because dad wasn't there that night and didn't get saved. And, and dad's just wondering, what is all of this my family's doing? And I keep trying to tell him, just bring him here. I got to talk to him. I'm going to tell him, buddy, you better just get to your knees because your whole family is there. Amen. They don't have stand a chance. So anyway, he, Jesus goes on to say, on Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in the mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So one place, he says, you can't see the kingdom of God. Now he says, you can't enter the kingdom of God. In other words, it's saying that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit. He is saying, look at guys, you come before the throne of God. Let, we all can come, right? God wants us there. But when you come in the carnal, with a carnal attitude and a carnal mind, it doesn't get you anywhere. That does not move God. So we have to practice um, how to get there. So let's do that. Let's go back to Romans and go to chapter 12. Y'all okay? Yeah. Thank you, Fonda. I'm more than okay. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay, chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, again, I... I understand that when you bring a sacrifice, it either dies or you give it away. 
In other words, if you bring a sacrifice, let's say of, of your finances, you give it away. If you offer up a sacrifice of praise, you're giving your praise away. Amen. If you bring an animal to the temple to be sacrificed, it's going to die. So this is telling us that when you, if you're truly going to present yourself, um, your, your uh, body, which, which Paul is saying, I beseech you, he's begging you, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. It's no longer yours. As soon as you and I recognize that this is no longer ours, it then becomes holy and without blame. Oh, you guys aren't listening to me now. It's holy and without blame. It's not until we do present ourselves a living sacrifice. It, these are not just words that we, we memorize. These are words that we have to live. They have to become rhema in our life, not just logos. They need to become rhema. They, they need to be alive within us. And so we present ourselves a living sacrifice, and he is the one that makes it holy and without blame. Do you see that? But first of all, it takes you and I doing that. And watch what happens now. So we present our bodies, but let's watch what happens to our soul. And it says, and do not be conformed to this world. Well, wonder why, because that's carnal. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we just learned out, learned one way how to have a spiritual mind. We have to have our mind renewed. In other words, I can't have the same mind that I used to have. I have now got to, and when it says that we can have a different mind, we can have our mind removed, I'm removed, yeah. We can have our mind renewed. It means that it can be done. Are, are you listening to me? It can be done. He doesn't tell you to have your mind removed. It's, it, uh, removed. Renewed if it can't be done. It can be done. So let's see how. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That you... Not the pastor, not some big time evangelist. The, you right there sitting where you are. Did you know that you can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? You and I can do it, but the only way we can do it is first of all present our bodies a living sacrifice. And second of all have our minds renewed. And things change. The scripture that says those who are in Christ are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's real. That we have become a new creation in Christ. Things change in us. But if we continue doing the same stuff we've always done, if we practice carnality rather than practice walking with the Lord in the Spirit, you'll just live your life out. Y y'all know in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks about the carnal Christian. You know what? Take a second. Just let's go there because it's important that we see this. If you go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, next book over. Oh, glory to God. And 2 Corinthians chapter 3 doesn't work. It's got to be 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay. Notice what it says. And I, brethren, this is Paul talking to the church at Corinth. I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual... Now, I want you to notice the next word is people, right? Right? Okay, people there is italicized. Do you see that if you have your Bibles open? I do not speak to you as to spiritual people. People is, they put that word in there because it made sense to them when they were translating the Bible. That's what that, that italicized thing means there. So, let's take it out. It says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual but as to carnal, <laughs> as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. So this is telling us if you don't have, if you can't feed on the, on the solid food of the word, that you're a carnal Christian. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, I want you to know that that was not me slapping you around. That was the Holy Spirit convicting you. 
Just listen to me. That's his job. He comes to convict, uh, convict us to sin, righteousness, and judgment. And when there's shortcomings in our lives, he is there to go, are you listening to that? Are you listening to that? It's not me getting into your laundry. It's him prompting you, listen. Listen, have your mind renewed to these things. Start applying them to your life, not just speaking them and, and having a bumper sticker Amen. and a cross around your neck. In fact, take the cross off and the bumper sticker off and let's see if you can still convince the people around you that you're a Christian. It should happen. Amen. Amen. Well, anyway, so he calls them carnal Christians. For you are carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and division among you, are you not still carnal, behaving as mere men? Go to Hebrews um, chapter 10. Look at this. I did say chapter 5, right? Yeah, I thought so. Five's better. Verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk instead of solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. This is another clue. How to be spiritually minded. You have to be skilled in the word of righteousness. Why? So you can teach. Oh, you guys are going to make me start running here. So you guys can teach. We're here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It is then your responsibility to go back to your homes and teach the very things that you're hearing. Now, if you think your wife is going to do that, then you've stepped out of line. Men, it is your responsibility. You are the spiritual leader. Well, I don't know the Bible. Well, it's about time you learn it. Amen. It's about time you start hanging out with other brothers that are strong in the word that can equip you. And it, hey, hunting's fun. Fishing is fun. You know, cutting horses are fun. But you know what? That's all carnality. I could be the greatest cutting horse guy in the whole world. I could hang out with the, the best cutters ever. And most of them are still going to hell because their idol is cutting horses. Are you listening to me? So what you need to do in order to renew your mind, hang out with other brothers and sisters who are not just puny in the word, but strong. They're able to teach you. Why? So you can teach others and get away from this carnality. Mm. So it says... But everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for is a babe. But he, they didn't say you're not saved. It just says you're a babe. You're a carnal Christian. That's an oxymoron, you guys. That doesn't make sense. Especially when you get solid in the word and you start thinking, I'm doing everything I can to get every piece of carnality out of me. And it still creeps in and I recognize it and I hate it. Does anybody else hate that stuff? When it shows up, some of your old past stuff, you know, shows up and uh, and I used to enjoy that stuff I want it out of me and it goes on to say but solid food belongs to those who are of full age alright solid food belongs to those who are full age it doesn't say perfect it says those who are mature that those who by reason and here's how you know you're, you're a full age that, uh, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, what that's telling us is those of us who are full age, we exercise these things. It's kind of like, you can say, I want to lose weight, I want to lose weight. I want to get in shape, I want to get in shape. You know what it takes? Going to the gym and those silly machines that you bought, all those years that are over there in the corner that you never use, you have, to, you have to exercise. And it's the same thing with us in our walk with God. We have to exercise these things. It's not good enough just to know the word and quote the word. You have to exercise it. You have to apply it. It has to be applicable to your life before you can teach. And what does that do? It then causes our senses, our spiritual senses, our our. Um, you know, our spiritual eyes, our spiritual ears, our, our, our tongues, um, our touch, 
Our spiritual senses become awakened when you and I start operating and exercising them. That's what I'm telling you, see? I have to have a renewed mind. I have to present my body. But then I also have to exercise these things. Practice it. I was sitting yesterday in the airport because I was so late. And what are the, what's there to do? So I sat there and I just watched people go by. And I didn't watch them passing judgment. But whenever something got on me where I, you know, I had kind of a negative feel, I'd go, Father, forgive me. Hallelujah. I don't know that person. That could be one of the strongest Christians ever. Maybe I need to get to know him. But I pray for him. And, and I started practicing that. And all of a sudden, I started falling in love with people that I normally am not in love with. Now, I do this a bunch, by the way. This isn't just something I started yesterday. But I do this a bunch, and I've, I start... Let me tell you something. When you become a pastor of a church, your life changes. Your attitude towards things change. Really, I'm telling you. Do, do you know that everything that he, she and he, and I do, and my wife do, affects our congregations? I'm the, man, that maybe... It, Look, the Bible tells us that, that the sins of a father go as far as the third and fourth generation. What do you think happens on a pastor to his congregation? And so for me, I don't want even the slightest bit. And, and Bill to tell you, I am not perfect. Say amen, brother. <laughs> but am I working on it? At least give me that. Uh, compassion. Amen. But I'm working on it. I'm not perfect. But I'm aware of the problems. I'm aware of when something happens now because I've been exercising my mind to be a spiritual mind rather than a carnal mind. And I'm going to tell you that man that started yelling at me at the church last week, he sure should be glad that I'm on this side instead of the other side because I'd have hit him. And he, yes, he was my elder, but he had no right to speak to me that way in front of a bunch of people. He really didn't have any right. And he, by the way, he's a pastor too. I mean, how does that happen, you guys? How does it happen? I never raised my voice or anything. I just stood my ground and uh, tried to love on him. I'm still trying to love on him. My brother has odd against me, so my Bible says I have to go and make it right. That's my responsibility. I don't care who's right or wrong. He could be wrong, but I still have to go make it right. Amen? Okay, so these are some of the ways that we become spiritually minded. You guys know um, in uh, James, it says, we'll just, I'll just quote it. No, go there. You, you got to see it. James chapter 3. Oh, you know what? I'm not in chapter 3, though. I say I'm just... I'm in chapter 1. Look at verse 22. Oh, no, let's back up to 21. That tells me more. Oh, somebody back there putting up uh, the words. That's all right. Don't worry about it. Don't put the word up. I'll, I'll quote this one, and you leave it on 22. 21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save what? Your souls. That's your mind, will, and emotions. That's your mind. So you can have a spiritual mind rather than a carnal mind. It's the implanted word. It's not just the word of God. It's the implanted word. It's the word that takes root within you. That nobody can steal. Because Satan constantly, the Bible talks about the fact that he's constantly coming trying to steal the word out of your heart. You guys know Mark chapter 4, right, when it talks about the seed and the sower. He comes and, and they receive it with gladness, but it's not implanted. So he steals it. Or the cares and the riches, deceitfulness of riches, rob it and don't allow it to be fruitful. Or the thorns and, and, the, and the weeds come and choke it out. You know, you know the scripture. That's, that's what Satan does. But we're talking about the implanted word that's able to save your soul. Get your mind right. Renew your mind. Amen. And then it says, but be doers of the word. This is the key. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. In other words, you read the word and you go, well, that doesn't make sense to me. Who cares? Do it anyway. Because when you don't, you know what it says right afterward? Deceiving yourselves. It doesn't even take Satan to deceive you. Are you listening to me? You can deceive yourself. 
It says when you're not a doer of the word, but a hearer only, you deceive yourselves. Now, when we're talking about having this renewed mind and having this spiritual mind rather than the carnal mind, that means in order for you and I, again, to operate this way, we have to be doers of the word. Have to be. Ah, when the word says, all power and authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, now you go and make disciples. What do you think that means? And now, don't. Just, I'm just going to kind of challenge you here. I want you to think right now. How many people right now are you discipling? Think about it. If you're not discipling anybody, then you're not operating the way Jesus wants you to operate. You're operating carnally. You're more worried about making the, you know, the big buck, having a nice house, having a nice family. And those are all good things. And Satan knows that's good stuff. So he... He wants you to have that stuff and let it become your idol. Hmm. It says, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. In other words, again, when we do not do the word, when, when it says, um, not only does he say all power and authority has been given to me, now go and make disciples, but he also says, and go preach the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay, so how many disciples do you have? Are you preaching the kingdom of God is at hand? It goes on to say, lay hands on the sick. I'll just ask you that. How many of you laying hands on the sick? Hallelujah. Praise God. But now let me ask you the next one. And cast out demons. That's right. Isn't it amazing that every time Jesus says, go lay hands on the sick, the next thing he does is cast out demons? Every time he went and healed people that has sickness, they also cast out demons. I just wonder how many sicknesses and diseases are brought about by a demonic influence that you and I aren't dealing with. Why? Because we're not spiritually minded. We think, <coughs> I got a cold. Guess what you got? A cold. You just brought it on yourself. Does the Bible tell you that? No, my Bible tells me right here in Matthew chapter 8 verse 17 that he bore my sicknesses and carried my diseases. Now he either did or he didn't. So if I got this thing <clears throat> and you're coughing and carrying on, what else could it be? Well, again, study the word and find out. It says, thorn in the flesh, fiery dart. Watch this, a spirit of infirmity. Huh? Yeah. All of these things are tools of the enemy that can come and tell you that you're sick or you have cancer, you have leukemia, or you have whatever, or you have lack of funds. Tell me in the Bible where in the Bible it says that you're supposed to be broken down and out. It doesn't. It says that he supplies all of your needs and it's not according to your gifts and talents and your job, but he supplies your needs according to his riches in glory. And if you haven't studied the word, you don't understand what that means. His riches in glory, there is no sickness and disease. There is no lack. He walks on streets of gold. What we consider the greatest thing, he walks on it and it's just pavement. I mean, again, let's become spiritually minded. That's our Lord. That's our Savior. I want to please him. Why? Because that's where I'm going to be the rest of eternity. So I have to start thinking spiritually. I have to start everything that I do. And again, I'm practicing this. I'm not perfect. I'm practicing this, but I'm getting better. Everything that I do, I constantly am trying to invite the presence of God and, and, and think spiritually. Oh, God's trying to. Thought I had something there. Hang on, hang on. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Whew. Well, one of the ways that you bring the presence of God is through praise and worship, right? He talked about it last week. Listen, if you came today and all this was was music, you missed out. It wasn't music. It was a vehicle to invite the presence of God in here so that the presence of God could then touch you. But if you're sitting there thinking about work tomorrow, sitting there thinking about um, what's going on this afternoon, or, oh man, this, my elbow's aching, or whatever it is that you're dealing with, and you're not allowing the presence of God, again, the presence of God is Jehovah Rapha, healing. If you're not there inviting that and knowing Look at Tech Room Devotional. I'm talking about the names of God. 
if, if the church could just get a hold of the names of God and then believe that that's really who he is, everything that you're going through, you've got victory. You cannot fail with the God that you and I serve and preach. You can't. But again, we need to become spiritually minded. And again, these are things that, that we can do. We can begin, again, present ourselves a, a living sacrifice, Amen. renew our minds, be doers of the word, not hearers only, and then feed on the pure milk, I mean the, the meat, as, and become teachers teaching others the very same thing. Let them see it in you and on you, walking in power. Even when it doesn't feel like you're walking in power. Yesterday on the side of the freeway with a flat tire, I didn't feel like I was walking in power. And I kept thinking, God, something's going to come out of this because your word says that you make all things work together for the good for those that love you and call according to your purpose. So I kept looking. What is it? What is it? Is there somebody going to pull over? Well, nobody pulled over. I had to change my own stupid tire with one of those little tiny donut things. So you can't drive very far. But I drove up to um, King City in California, drove up there, and uh, I'm not going to tell you the miracles that happened there. It's, I'm just telling you, you could see the presence of God right there in that thing. I had favor. Um, I, I called, I can tell you, I called Dollar, right? And they said, well, let us find a, a tire for you. I said, okay. So he called around. He said, okay, go over to this place, Rossi. They'll, they have a tire for you. So I pull over there. And by the way, I didn't know where it was. I just go, okay, where is this? Oh, there it is. I pull in. And um, it was closed. And about that time, my phone rang. And the guy said, hey, I'm sorry, but Rossi's is closed today. I said, yeah, I know. I'm sitting here. He said, well, let me find another place. I'll call you right back. Well, I had seen a tire place right down the road. So I thought, shoot, if I could just get this thing passed, I'll pay for it. Just get me on the road. I got to catch an airplane. So I drove back there. I pull up and I'm talking to the guy and pretty soon the owner comes out and he goes, are you Keith Brown? <laughs> yeah, I have dollar rental cars on the phone. I'm supposed to give you a tire. The tire was already ready. I mean, tell me something. If you don't think that's the presence of God, I, I don't know. And, and again, Bill will contest to this and so will my wife. You know, five, six, eight years ago, I'd have been on the side of the road throwing, uh, you know, the wrenches and kicking the tires and cussing and carrying on. Was I a preacher back then? I was. But this understanding of having a spiritual mind rather than a carnal mind is victory, you guys. I'm telling you, it is victory. So let's begin to practice it. Amen. Let me pray with you. Father, once again, we just thank you and praise you. Your word is so good. But just to speak about your word being good, it's good even if we don't do anything about it. But when we take your word and apply it to our lives, oh, listen to this. This is where he was going to take me. Now I realize your word, you speak of and said, your word is living and powerful. See, when I'm a doer of the word, your word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, sword that pierces the division of the soul and the spirit and the bone and the marrow. Watch this. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There's that spiritual mind. So, Father, let us listen to your word. Hear your Holy Spirit as he, as he convicts us to sin righteousness and judgment. Not insult him or vex him or, or um, uh, turn our back on him, blaspheme him. But Father, let us learn to hear and recognize that he's trying to lead us because those of us who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God, he's trying to lead us into all truth and show us things to come. What a God you are. What, what, a, what a kingdom we live in. What a Lord you say, sent us. What love you've demonstrated to us. What joy fills my soul right now. Hallelujah. I just love you and I praise you. Father, I thank you for this church. But I can tell you right now, you've got so much for more for this church. The coolest part, and this I see in our own church, the coolest part is there's not a whole bunch in number here. 
But I know that this church is reaching the world, even with this few of numbers. And that is because of your power flowing through this church. I pray that they'd not take their minds off of that, not look at the, the numbers that are in here, but realize the, the uh, outreach that they're, they're doing. With, a, with pastors like they have, they're reaching way out beyond this little church, but this blessed church. And so let that happen. Same with our church. As we're struggling in numbers and, and trying to find our place in a community, ah, it's just awesome when we hear from Germany or we hear from Vietnam where they're using our videos and people are being taught and trained. And Father, it's not just Pastor Dave and Kathleen and Deb and I, but it's our congregations that support what we're doing and get involved and begin to pray and begin to give, not just of money, but give of their time and their efforts and, and, and get involved with the church. We can change this world. We bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor David. I'm not going to add to her, but I am going to tell you that something that Keith hit on that, that, that the Holy Spirit spoke to me when he said it. If you're going from one preacher to another and listening to TV and radio and you're not getting in the Word, you're missing out on That's what right. he said. Because what he said was by the renewing of our minds. Link up. And it's the washing of the water of the Word empowered by the Holy Spirit in our personal lives that is the, is the thing that changes us. Not what another preacher says, not whether it's Keith or myself or anybody else that you might listen to. It's what God speaks to your heart and your spirit when you're reading that Word. Because He will empower you. It's the Holy Spirit that wrote that Word, and He can make it illuminated in your heart. And that'll be the thing that'll change your mind. It'll, come, it'll change you to be conformed to a spiritual mind. Good Word. Remember, Jesus loves you, and so do we. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the Word preached. And as you apply that word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making him your Savior and then making him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior and He is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching, and so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make Him the Lord of your life. And as you make Him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation 
uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo, and uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you He'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord, and Jesus loves you, and so do we.